You're listening to the Walled Garden Podcast. This podcast is a part of the Walled Garden Online Community a community dedicated to sharing and discussing philosophy, beliefs, ideas, and creativity among all types of people in order to gain new insight on some of life's biggest questions and make the most of how we live. We appreciate you joining us. Welcome, everybody, uh, to, to our, what is this, our, it's our fourth meetup, but our third inspiration session. We've got Kai Whiting today which I'm very much looking forward to. Kai, is this a Christmas sweater that you're wearing or not? Yes. Okay, it's so wonderful. cold in England and I'm not used to it that I have put my warmest jumper on. Heck yeah, man. That's beautiful. I love it. Um, so I, I, should, I should quickly mention to everybody, um, the reason I put this background in is because the actual background is uh, a motel door in Mackay, Queensland. <laughs> so I'm traveling around at the moment. Um, thought you know it's not necessarily the back, best background but I wanted to say a couple of things before we jump into Kai's session here firstly we do want to welcome um, a few more members to the World Garden uh, so this week we had uh, uh, Brennan and Scott Mike Sue and Federico uh, join up so we're very excited to have them thank you very much for joining the community it's great to have them here um, and also having Mike join up this week means we now have one, two, three. We have four Michaels, which is technically, I think, about 35% of our membership. So Michaels are leading the way for some reason, which is wonderful. Um, and, uh, and I guess I just wanted to uh, introduce Kai. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, I met Kai for the first time a few years ago now when, when I, you know, wanted to have him on the podcast. And um, one of the things that I straight away noticed about Kai and his a- approach was he's um, he's a very uh, he's a very caring figure. He's a very mentoring figure in terms of he he looks for every opportunity to nourish the good in somebody else. You know, if he if he sees it or if he sees something stri- somebody striving towards something. You know, he saw that I was trying to create a great podcast about stoicism, something that is very close to his heart, and he. He really looked for every opportunity that he could straight from our first meeting to uh, encourage me and also to give me opportunities to speak to certain people um, or to, uh, you know, go down certain avenues. And what I always found with Kai was uh, this, this very caring figure who, who would uh, 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 seek to, to push me in the right ways, you know, to, to <laughs> excel my own expectations for uh, my abilities and everything that I was doing with the podcast. And so um that kind of flourished into a great friendship. He's doing so much good in the world with what, uh, you know, what he's putting together and his, his book is wonderful being better stoicism for a world worth living in. And, and, and that's, that's another thing, you know, it's like uh, Kai has a very um, beautiful approach to his, his philosophical explorations. You know, the, the book says it all right. Like stoicism for a world worth living in. This is a world worth living in. Let's nourish it. Let's make it better. Let's, you know, let's grow what is good. You know, let's, let's work on what is not going so well. And, and so uh, Kai, uh, uh, other than that um, wholly insufficient intro, I just want to, you know, say thank you for, for being here in the world garden. And um, I'm excited to throw it over to you today and see, see what your, uh, what your vision is, I guess. So over to Kai. Thank you very much for that introduction. And it is funny that I'm wearing my Christmas jumper, but I am really that cold. I've been spoiled for so long by not being in the UK in terms of weather. So, I, you know, it's a beautiful jumper, though. It's very colourful. And I know Sharon's appreciating it. But it's so bright, she needs to wear glasses. So <laughs> I think that... that so I had to get our jokes in early, right? So and I, I think, think we're going to was... have to have a, a Christmas sweater party, by the way, on the <laughs> wall garden or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely i think the first to show what i would want to do in the wall garden i think i must start with the socratic dialectic so i'm going to like put some people on the spot right because that's that's the best way so i'll put sharon on the spot because sharon speaks the least so i mean we have had this discussion before but i'll just throw it out there so sharon why is virtue the only good how would we how would we as stoics stake that claim how would we defend it 
Why would I you make such a claim? I am utterly stymied. I need some time to think about that. That's cool. Can I can I pass cool. on to someone else? You can pass, yeah. So I'll ask the question again, because a lot of the time we say stoics like virtue is the only good. And yet we never, if we are stoically inclined or we are stoically as in terms of our identification, we never think about why we make such a claim or why such a claim is worth thinking about or worth stating. And then because we don't think about that, we don't think, well, how can I defend such a claim? I mean, it is a religious claim, right? This is the yes. point that I make, I would say, almost all the time when I have people who tell me, no, we don't need the stoic God. We don't need the stoic God at all. We can't prove there's a God. We can't prove there isn't. And I'm like, prove to me that virtue is the only good. So what they're doing is they're moving the faith-based claim to a different turtle, right? Just a different approach. You say, okay, so we remove the God. Great. Okay, God is dead. I sound like Misha, but God is dead. Okay, so why is virtue the only good? So I'm going to pass it on to Jacob. We're going to put him on the spot. Why is this claim worth making, Jacob? Why is it important? Well, first off, uh, can I, can I like, a, you know, like a spelling bee when they ask, you to use it in a sentence <laughs> given i have like <laughs> given i have like less background uh than maybe you know simon and and uh, sharon do on on things like that right like making that statement if you believe that you're a stoic or that stoicism is important to you then you must believe that virtue is the only good i mean there's very little that stoicism claims other than that or stoicism proceeds and claim but stoics claim that virtue is the only good so why is it worth even making such a claim so Christians will claim a lot of things and Jewish people claim a lot of things and Muslims will claim a lot of things. Stoics per se don't actually <laughs> state a lot. They don't say there's like 613 mikveh, 613 rules that you must follow. In, you know, they don't say that you must follow a certain amount of days. You must celebrate two Eids. You must pray five times a day. The Stoics are quite simple. They're like, virtue is the only good. There you go. <laughs> That's it. So why that's the big claim. I'm not saying there's no there's no claims that derive from that claim, because as we'll see, they do derive. But why make such a claim? Why is such a claim important to you, Jacob, for example? And you don't I need think... to know the answer. I'm just this is this is the kind I'm just illustrating the kind of things that I would do as a member of the walled garden. That's what I'm doing. Because yeah. I think better to them to tell you, like, I'm Kai and I do this, is to to prove the point by showing you. Yeah. But no, it's it's like fascinating to me. That's what I love about it. Is like I don't really have an answer, but it's got my mind going, you know. And but it also gets my mind going in a lot of different directions because then I start to get into like, well, how would you define virtue and how would you define good? Because we have to start there if we're going to come up with a conclusion as to why we stake the claim and what it means, because it could mean something different for this person and that person, right? Completely, but because because so when I hear stay, it, we should stay that. When I hear it, or like when I say, you know, virtue is the only good. And like I say, I'm not as educated on like the philosophy that and all, the, all that was taught, you know, by the ancient Stoics. But I, I think the way that I define virtue is the, you know, the striving to live a life of positive experiences, positive emotions, happiness, joy, etc. And so the statement to me feels self-evident because anything good would be categorized under virtue or or would lead to virtue yeah. and anything virtuous is good by what we have decided good means but is it, is it that we have decided right <laughs> is it that we've decided because as i make as i push back against people who are agnostic or atheistic lawrence becker who was a who was a very wonderful individual actually and he was a contemporary yeah. i would call contemporary stoic he developed a stoicism that didn't require the, the god or at least he believed so and he said, our norms and values tell us what is good. And I'm like, have you seen the climate change crisis here? Because our norms and values have created a climate crisis. And if you live in California, California, sorry, you know that that's not good. So if we say what we believe is good, right, then different people will believe different things are good because we'll have cultural norms and values. This is why natural law and storism is so important because regardless of our norms and values, we can understand natural law. We can know what is good by an interconnection with the logos, right? So when people say, no, we don't need the we don't need God. I'm like, well, the historians couldn't make that claim because the whole idea that virtue is the only good 
was based on the fact that virtue is like the, 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 the essence, the rationality of God. And to align oneself with God is good. And that is expressed in terms of, you know, a manifestation of virtue would be uh, acting appropriately in something that looks like courage, unless we're sage, unless we're sage, we can say that is courage, right? So Leonidas Konstantikos, who was the co-author of Being Better, he would make the point that Scarface is bold, Al Capone was bold, but they weren't brave. Which is mm-hmm. some of the challenges, like Ryan Hardy's got a book that Courage is Calling, and sometimes you're like, is that courage? Or is that being bold? Is that being like, you know, in somebody's face, you know, in the face of, a, you know, being resilient potentially? Or is it really being courageous? So the Stoics are very clear. So in terms of like, you asked about being good, the Stoics would say that is a character that you have crafted that is incapable of making a moral mistake. That's why it's independent of our norms and values and externalities. I don't need to belong to a democratic, reasonable Western country to know that certain things are correct or incorrect or what's perhaps better appropriate or inappropriate. So I think as Stoics, or if we, oh, say Sharon, go on. You just raised your hand. Yeah, I, I was just wondering about the idea of moral intuitions, the idea that we all have inbuilt moral intuitions that even the the worst uh, serial killer or what have you still deep down knows the difference between good or virtue and bad. I, I don't know if I'm taking you off in a different direction. No, absolutely, but... absolutely not. I, it depends on your cognitive uh, abilities. There are some people who may, for example, if they've had a car accident and some part of their head's been hit and their brain is damaged, they will not be able yep. to tell. Right. And this, I think I think my interpretation of it from a contemporary Stoic perspective, the Stoics never said this because they didn't have the scientific awareness is that person who's been brain damaged in an emotional sense in a car crash cannot experience eudaimonia they, because they can't flourish in the true sense of the word. That doesn't mean that they're not worthy of their humanity. That doesn't mean that we should not you know, incorporate them and integrate them in the best way that we can into society. Right. It just means that one cannot flourish. So I make the argument that. A person who has bipolar and is unable to take the medication that they need at the time that they have an episode is not flourishing. If they are having an episode and they can't take medication to minimize the the effects of that, then they're unable to flourish. That doesn't mean that if we gave them the medication that they wouldn't be able to flourish. But in the state of having a a bipolar episode and not being able to be treated, I don't think a person would be able to flourish because at that point, you can't always recognize what is right from wrong. So yes, the Stoic would say that if you are a rational being, then you are capable of, by virtue by virtue of being, of being close to the Logos, understanding or having the Logos around you, in you, then you are capable of being able to dis- you know, understand what is a appropriate, an appropriate action. But it's not a good action until you become a sage, because you're still that square <laughs> peg trying to squeeze yeah. into that round <laughs> hole, right? But you know that it was inappropriate. It's kind of like if you speak another language and you go, oh, that's wrong, but I don't know what is right. I know it sounds wrong. I know that in Spanish it doesn't sound right, but I don't know how to correct it. Whereas a sage would always, you know, they would know that they're correct. That moment they they eat the porridge and they go, suddenly I'm eating porridge correctly. We can only eat porridge appropriately. But if we are listening to the logos, and I think we are, as long as we cognitively function properly, we are perfectly capable of knowing what is appropriate. When we shape our character so that we become the round peg and the round hole, that's when we can honestly say that we are being virtuous. That's why it's so black and white. The peg fits or it doesn't. If it nearly fits, it doesn't fit, right? Because if I say this jumper nearly fits me, then you say, well, really, it doesn't fit, guy. (laughs) Another way of saying nearly fits is it doesn't fit. (laughs) So that's why the Stoics are so sort of, you know, black and white on virtuous or, or, or vicious. And that's why we say, right. they say that that doesn't mean that there's no sense of progress, because as I made uh, a point with Leo in one of uh, our talks with Simon, if you can imagine the portrait of Dorian Gray, he becomes hideous and grotesque as each action he takes deforms his character to the point that he has a key and he hides his portrait from everybody else. 
Even the man who paints the portrait is not allowed to set or is not allowed to see it. So every moral error from a straight perspective is the same in gravity. There's no more, one moral error that is worse than the other. But as we continuously commit moral errors, our, our character gets knocked. And if we get knocked to a certain point, it's so grotesque that it's almost, quote unquote, inhuman. It's, it's almost that you're so far away from the Logos that it's very difficult to bring yourself back or you know, to find, just, find you to Menea in any way, shape or form. So that's why people say, so you say like the actions that say a tyrant takes and the actions that you take are equally incorrect. Yes, but it doesn't mean that our characters are the same shape because they will continuously huh. do these things. Of course, a lot of us would be tyrants and you know, or could act as many tyrants at least if we had the resources that some tyrants have. So when I say mini tyrant, I just want to distinguish between the word tyrant as a political word and the tyrant in the sense of uh, uh, somebody who abuses their kids at home. They act as a mini tyrant. They're not a tyrant in the true sense of the world because that requires a political state, but they can act as like a mini tyrant. So outside the four walls they're in, they might do more damage if they could, but let's say they have a lowly job. They don't have the power to do what they do at home, but at home they quote unquote rule the roost and they are very, they act very inappropriately towards their children. But those children can still grow up and say, I refuse to continue down that route. Even though I have a really bad you know, parent, I am not going to follow down that path. I can choose another path. And assuming they have not been cognitively damaged by that, which they may have been, they will then be able to flourish and achieve unity. Does that make sense, Sharon and Jacob? It does, and you're blowing my yes. mind. Can, can yeah. I contribute maybe a small thing in regards Please. to the virtue, just because I, it's been on my mind? Because this is this is such a the, the question of, you know, why is virtue the only good? It's so interesting, right? Because a few months ago, I wrote something, uh, and uh, as I was writing down some just some little tidbits of wisdom and stuff, and something came to me. It was like, God is the only good. It's a matter of definition, right? Like, uh, you know, this is, this is the, the definition that we've put into our culture. Um, and it's so, to me, it seems, it seems almost like, um, you know, obviously the, the concept of God has been looming over our heads for centuries, you know, and one of, you know, well, for example, in Mesopotamia, um, you know, the idea of God was like, okay, you have to have something above the, the, the king or the ruler, right? Because otherwise they just immediately become the God of the nation. They become a tyrannical or whatever, but you need something to hold them accountable, right? And when we're talking about this, you know, Kai, you mentioned there this idea that, you know, it, it either fits in the hole or it doesn't, right? There's no in between, right? And I kind of thought about that because virtue is kind of on this... It, one of the reasons it's so hard to hit virtue is because there's always something that you could be doing better. Right? It's like, it's like, almost and, always, right? Because if it was always, and, it'd be impossible. So it's almost always. Well, almost always. Yeah, that's it. It's that thin little line, right? But even if you think <laughs> about, okay, you're setting the table, right? Like there's, there's thousands of things that you could do to make setting the table, you know, for, for dinner even better right and to make the claim right that i'm being virtuous it's almost like you'd have to be afraid that you're going to be immediately struck by lightning to make that claim right because it's like really did you wash the did you wash the dishes perfectly right i mean perfectly with the right kind of washing liquid with the right temperature in the water you know did you use the right kind of dishes did you use the right kind of cutlery you know have you invited the best people over to you know, have dinner with it's it's like there's so much there's so much that you can be thinking about and to me when you talk about virtue being the only good it's like yeah, it it kind of needs to be in that really high place so that we very rarely, if ever, use the term to describe ourselves and our actions because it needs to be the ideal that is constantly pulling us upward towards better things. And if we have that ideal up there, whether you call it virtue or God or universal reason or the logos, it's like that's the thing that's going to be... If, if, if you place it in that high shelf on your list of priorities, then it's going to constantly be pulling you upwards because you know that it's something that is so unachievable, but perhaps maybe if you 
if you really focused hard enough, you could get it just right. You know, and and I don't know that that's just kind of what I was thinking about, and 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 that's what the thoughts that you were giving kind of brought up for me. It's a beautiful metaphor. It's a wonderful metaphor. I'm I'm glad you've managed to ground all what I've said in a very sort of academic way into something that, you know, is usable. It is that sense, right? It is that sense. If it were laying a table, that did you know? Because the, the sage, the one who is virtuous, doesn't know everything, right? They're not expected to know. But for example, you might, look, you know, the sage could ask, well, what should I do to reduce my carbon footprint? But the sage would know who to ask. They would develop. That's why they, you know, that's why being, having a friend is actually, is seen as a good thing, right? A sage having a sage as a friend is a really good thing. So I'll say, but then I would know because my sage friend, who's an expert in climate breakdown, would tell me what I have to do. So it's not that they would know have all sense of knowledge but yes it is did that did the angle that i laid that knife is the knife polished to that level did i polish it with the right polish did i it is exactly that and at that moment that's why it's like that perfect sound and i you know you guys i'm not a musician but sharon and you someone would tell me and jason actually sorry, jacob sorry because you've got guitars and you it's 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 that moment where you hit that note just right and you guys must play pieces and go i played it well but I can't say I played it really, really well because he just, yeah. it was good enough to the untrained ear. The guy's ear, he thought it was great. But I know that another musician would tell me that I didn't quite pluck the string. I didn't quite hit that note in the perfect way. It was just needed a little bit more. It just wasn't quite right. And that, that's the level of quote unquote perfection that is, which is asked of us as Stoics, right? Or people and who are influenced by Stoics. And I have to chuck something in here because your example there, Kai, of um, playing music perfectly, it's like we know that human beings have a sense for when a musician is hitting the mark of virtue or when a dancer is hitting the mark of virtue because what immediately happens when we see that or when we hear that is you cannot help but be thrown into a state of ecstasy and you leap up to like this is something that jordan peterson talks about all the time it's like in the olympics you see these ice figure skaters right and one team comes out and they get like you know 9.5 9.5 9.5 everybody's like and then of course the people after that are thinking how the hell can i come out and beat this but somehow they do and they push themselves just beyond the limits of human capacity to do the best thing that anybody has ever seen in the world of ice figure skating and you watch the crowd the crowd has a sense for when people have hit that mark of virtue because they leap to their feet and it's like that moment of everybody is celebrating at once because humanity has just achieved something that is so impossible and that's virtue right it's like when they've hit that mark that you never see so i don't i just thought that idea of the music is so perfect because we know what it looks like yeah, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon, you were going to say something. Yeah, well, I'm wondering what you have to say about virtue and perfection. I mean, are they one and the same? Because it seems to me that virtue is always situational. And, um, and you could say that within any given situation, the highest good is more a sense of aptness or appropriateness for the time, the place, the circumstance, et cetera. And I mean, I guess I'm just a little nervous about the idea of, of Stoics becoming these very anxious people, always trying to be perfect, perfect, perfect. And anyway, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, it's, it's one of the great Stoic ironies, isn't it? The only thing in your control is whether you cultivate a character that is virtuous or not it's the only thing that's yeah. in your control so it's the only thing and ironically enough it's the only thing that you shouldn't worry about because it's you know in the sense of a non strike i'm really worried because it's out of my control i don't know if i'm good enough it's like actually in stoicism that's the only thing that you have in your possession that's the only thing you have so i want to say that it's perfection it, it is the sort in the moral sense right so you don't have to have the godlike knowledge for example, of the abrahamic god of knowing the future that's not the case. So I gave we gave the example in being better that a sage didn't know that the state of California, let's say for sake of argument, were not recycling properly. They were sending their plastic off to another country. Now, if the sage has no way of knowing that, then they are not they are not morally responsible, are they? If the state of California then chucks stuff in, let's say, the Philippines. But the moment yeah. the, the sage knows that, 
or anybody trying to approach sainthood, they would say, oh, I can no longer recycle in this particular way. So what I'll do is I'll reduce my plastic consumption because now I know that they are not recycling. They might have told me they were, they might say there was funding for it, but in the end, they weren't doing it because the, the factory that was doing it was, was so much plastic that they couldn't cope. What, does, what would the sage do then? Okay, I must reduce my plastic footprint even further. I must, I must put my mind into the right, you know, in the right way so that I don't contribute to this problem. If we believe that, you know, looking after others when it comes to climate breakdown and plastic pollution is something that is worth doing, right? And all things, all things being equal, because it depends on the context, yes. So you're absolutely right. It is context driven. It's not the perfection in the sense of, of God, which is a constant state of perfection. In, in, in a different, it's a different sense. But they do say the Stoics, I mean, there is an argument that the, the, the Stoics say that the sage has, has achieved more than God because God was perfect, to be, you know, perfect, and they had to make an effort to be, to be perfect. So on some level, they've, they've gone above God because they've made the effort. Now, that's a very controversial uh, say, uh, stoic argument, and it's very, very nuanced, and I don't think it's particularly helpful. But there is, you know, there is that sense of that's the level of, of um, effort and achievement that is required. I don't feel a sense of worry. I do identify myself as, as a stoic, and I know other people who are stoic influence wouldn't identify themselves as such. I don't feel myself worrying because... That's the only thing I have in my control. So if it's in my control, I can do something. And if it's not, then why worry? Right? <laughs> that, that's the paradox. But Stoics love paradoxes. But I, I think that this is the kind of thing I find really important is that going back to the most basic of questions, because we can do all sorts of things as a Stoic community, as contemporary Stoics. We can argue if there's a God. We can argue uh, about what should we do in terms of say uh, gender inequality at work and it's like but why go back to the right basic why do we believe that virtue is the only good if we don't have that sound in our mind then we won't yeah. apply yeah. that argument properly to look at say gender inequality in the workplace we won't be able to soundly look at why we have an issue with climate breakdown and what is in within our control to solve that issue because we haven't grappled with the fundamental message of stoicism and there's only one virtue is the only good i mean it's not even the highest good which is more aristotelian it's it is the, just only, the only good it's, yeah. it's the only good it's, it's, it's literally black and white and the moment we think that a certain indifferent is always preferred that's when we err so we'll say things like money is a preferred indifference i'm like is it because if, if it's always preferred right it would be a virtue meaning always good sometimes if you're an alcoholic the first thing you need is a five dollar bill in your back pocket Right. So this is why we have to also be careful because, and I've made the mistake in the past myself, like it's written. So, and that Zeno has his, you know, makes his argument. He doesn't allow Cleanthes to take the money off the elder council because he says, right now, basically, you can't use that money in an appropriate way. If you use, if, if you get that money, you, it will damage your character. So normally, often, money is something that's preferred, but not always. And that's right, what's fundamental. Right. That's why people say things like people got really upset in Stoic on 2021 saying, well, I don't understand, for example, how suicide can ever be, you know, a good thing. I think they use the word righteous, right, which is not a word the Stoics would use anyway. But it always depends. It, and I've tried, I tried to show them, look, if you had your four year old and they crossed the street and the car came hurtling around, if you pushed your four year old out of the way, knowing full well that you would die, can't you see how? that would be a stoic thing to do they're like that's different no but that's suicide if you know full well if you think oh my gosh that four by four that suv is coming around the corner let's say 60 miles an hour and you have a split second to either let your child you know be injured let's say put it that way or you might actually take the full force of this vehicle it's almost you know it's almost likely to be suicide but no one would say to you how terrible how vicious of you to do that to allow yourself to die, to save this person. So that's one example where you can easily point to where even suicide is sometimes, not often, but sometimes preferred because the alternative is what? But that depends, you say, well, okay, why do I value the child? And you say, well, there's circles of concern and there's a lot of, there's a lot of other reasons, archaeosis and things like that. You say, well, I value them even on a biological reason because they've taken my genes forward. I was told, you know, in my social role as a stoic and you can have a lot of different arguments. But the key one is to say, this is why even suicide can sometimes be preferred. Even money can sometimes be dispreferred. 
Do you see what I mean, Chan? Yes, yes, I do. Can I ask you another question? Of course. Uh, yeah, uh, going off in a different direction. I would love to hear what you have to say to the aggressively anti-theists uh, uh, amongst uh, the uh, cont contemporary Stoics. I, I just tell them, prove to me that virtue is the only good and no one's been able to do it. The, 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 only, one, the only one who's come close, which is really cool, and I like Greg Lopez a lot, he's a really good friend of mine and Simon will tell you. He said, well, the Stoics could prove that that, that, that was the case, right? I said, yeah, but then show me, that, show me why Stoicism is correct. I said, you've just moved it. You've just said, yes, within Stoicism, that can happen, but you can't prove to me that Stoicism is the philosophy that we should be using. Prove to me that Stoicism is the, the right, quote unquote, philosophy. Prove it to me. So even if you say, well, the Stoics could, could argue, which they did argue using the state God anyway, but let's say they didn't. That's not the case. But let's say they didn't. Even if that were true, you still have to prove to me that Stoicism is the correct and right philosophy. That you can't do it. Yeah. The, the thing is, the reason... Why I think that, there were, that the atheistic or atheist uh, Stoic camp have had uh, much attention is partly because of academia. It is not cool in academia to talk about the Stoic God or God in general, and we are poorer for it. So they could hide behind the PhD on their wall to say, to sort of claim a moral claim that they just couldn't substantiate. But because there wasn't any academics arguing the case for the Stoic God until Leo and I have wrote a specific paper on it within the I'm saying within the state community, they had a kind of free for all because they were like, well, this person hasn't got a PhD and this person, so therefore they're wrong. And then when they and I came along, it was like, well, this is a peer review paper. How many peer review papers have you got? And these are historic authors who have written books. How many peer reviews papers have you got? Where is the community saying that you're correct? And they couldn't point to that. So they had to, they had to concede. They had to say, well, it's a perhaps it's a valid interpretation. And that's why I think that they've had too much, quote unquote, power for too long, because there hasn't been an argument looking at it from, like from a historic argument going, OK, logically, <laughs> prove it, logically. And they just move, they just move the arguments. They either move it to virtue is the only good or go prove to me virtue is the only good. Or they, prove, they say, well, Stoicism has proofs for that. Prove to me that Stoicism is the philosophy that we should be following, because I can't see it. Now, I would say... If you believe that, that humans are here to flourish, then yes, Stoicism makes sense. If you tell me that that's absurd, that, that humans are not here to flourish, then follow Camus, uh, Camus, sorry, follow him, follow somebody else, potentially follow Nisha. But if you believe that we're here to flourish, then I think Stoicism does provide the answer to that question. But I still, it's, still, it's still based on the argument that if you believe so it's, again, it's, it's, I can say, if this is true, then this is true. What I can't do, and according to David Hume, say, this is the fact, and therefore here, this is the value. So I'll give you a very simple example. When you have climate change, people will say, if you drive a four by four, this is bad for the climate, therefore you shouldn't drive four by four. The fact that the climate is warming, it is a, that's just a fact. It doesn't tell me what I should do about it. If I live in Greenland, I might be very happy that the climate is warming. Now, it may be true that the four by four is causing, if it's a uh, uh, fossil fueled uh, combustion that we're going on about, that is true that that may contribute to climate change. But it is equally true, potentially, if I live where you live, that if I don't drive my grandchild to school, they won't get there. So which fact is more important? Can you see? I can't, yeah. and John Peterson makes this point as well, I can't say just because something is a fact that I should value it, because one is, yes, if I drive my 4x4 four four using, let's say, diesel, I'm contributing to the local pollution and I'm contributing to climate change. If I don't do so, my four-year-old my four year, four year old grandchild will not get to school. Which, which, which one do I value more? Facts cannot tell me. So I point this out. They go very quiet. But this is not an argument that I made. It's David Hume. So it's a very, a very old argument, <laughs> but they're not used. They're not used to having those arguments. But it's a, it's a stoic way of approaching the, the question. 
And then I look at the ethics yes. and say, if you remove the stoic God, the, the ethic falls apart. And Tony Long or A.A. Long says particularly, you know, specifically that it's parasitical. The ethics are parasitical on the stoic theology. And he made this, made this statement in 1996. The problem is that the people that are writing the books aren't necessarily reading, I would say, the best scholar we've had for a long time, him and uh, uh, Professor Chris Gill. We have also others, but particularly in terms of like very specific, nuanced arguments, uh, I think those two are, have been the best in the last 30, 40 years, certainly. And it's just swept under the carpet, Sharon, unfortunately. But their mm. arguments don't have any rigor and they don't stand up to logic. I don't, I don't believe so. They haven't managed to convince me otherwise. And as I said, I'm not even using my arguments. I'm using uh, academic arguments from scholars that are far greater than myself, far greater. I don't hold a candle. I hope, I hope one day I might approach uh, Tony Long, but I doubt it. Can you guys see why Kai's name actually means warrior now? Because <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's, he's willing to pick a fight, right? But he's willing to, you know, do it in a way where he has some real backing to him, you know, and, and this is one of the yeah. things that I love about Kai is his willingness to, um, to, to look at the areas of our culture where he thinks we're really actually falling behind because of our quote unquote progress. Right. And he's willing to kind of pull us back and say, hang on, we're actually losing something very important. And he's willing to use logic to get there as well, which I'm obviously not going to be the person to do that. But um, uh, Kai, I wonder if you could uh, maybe speak to something you said there really uh, stood out to me, which is, well, I guess it kind of brought up these uh, these images in my mind of the current culture that we are living in and many of the kind of issues that are arising. Um, what do you think are some of the big issues that you see in our culture at the moment uh, that are arising because people don't have that kind of solid, firm foundation in what is, what is virtue? Because I, I see a lot of people even just misrepresenting the, the meaning of words um, in completely silly ways you know in order to argue for why they're making a certain decision or why they're fighting for a certain cause or this or that and and sometimes it's so clearly not the meaning of the word or you know not not the the the, the right way to go but it seems like a lot of people are really mixed up in their language and and so i guess you know what are some of the big issues that you see in our culture at the moment because we don't have that firm foundation in in, in our language and, and and the true definitions of these words Loss of faith. I personally think that some, some aspects of, of woke politics, not all, I'm not complete, there are not, it's not like it has nothing good to add, right? Because it's indifferent. <laughs> there are some aspects that are talking about justice and injustice. When you lose a sense of faith, it can be a humanist, it doesn't have to be in God, but something greater than yourself you then need to belong to something. And if the thing you choose to belong to tells you there's safety in numbers, that it's important to be part of a tribe, that you are, you are on the right side of history, such a dangerous presumption, such a day. I wish people would stop telling our people they're on the wrong side of history, unless they're very careful. And there are key points where you can say, well, legally, this, this has passed, for example, like, I don't know, for example, gay marriage, right? Now, there's a, legal, there's a legal framework in a lot of countries now. And yeah, you probably are on the wrong side of history, right? For the moment. <laughs> like, and because that can change. I mean, you only have to have a certain, let's say, dictator. I mean, 1920s Berlin would tell you, right? And so lack of faith, a loss of faith, and then the inability to see the circular things that you and I talk about. So I mean, patterns, again, maps of meaning uh the, the history books tell you something so when you claim for example that something is like slavery you have to be very careful which, firstly which slavery are you referring to are you talking about roman slavery yeah. are you talking about the african-american slavery are you talking about irish slaves going to the middle east like first yeah. what are you talking about and then what does history say and it's very easy to think that in 2021 for example or in 2022, that you have seen the worst whatever you've seen. This is the worst pandemic. This is the worst war. This is the worst, you know, 
this is the worst form of racism I've ever seen in, let's say, the UK. It is so easy when you haven't got your head in a history book to make such claims. Then if you then if you don't look at history and then you claim that you're on the wrong side of history and you divide and conquer, which is what is happening, because they all say that every single conversation we have is about a power struggle. That is either your, your, someone's being racist towards you and they have power over you and you're a victim or, you know, it's something along those dynamics. And Villeneuve did Arrival and that's a film which has aliens in, but it's not about aliens, it's about communication. And if you believe that we're either a hammer or a nail, then you are either hammering or you're getting nailed. There's no nuance there. So in, in that particular film, they say it's dangerous. If you use the word tool, it means different to use the word weapon. Now, a tool can be a weapon, but not a weapon. You know, a, a weapon is a tool, right? But weapon means something different. And not all tools are weapons. And the problem is when we weaponize language, then it becomes we're either being hammered or we're being nailed because we've weaponized language. We've changed the meaning, which is another form of weaponizing because you pull the rug from somebody's feet, they fall down and before they know it, the word, the word such as racist, British, male, female, men, woman, Muslim, Islamophobia, for example, is one of those words I'm like, you know, being a Muslim, I'm like, but Islamophobia is a dangerous word because it says that I can't criticize Islam and ideas should be allowed to be criticized, right? This is where you say anti-Semitic. You're not talking about Judaism as a religion. You're talking about the Jewish people. And that's a very different thing. So you can see that happening and you can see the weaponization. And because of this loss of faith, the sense of, you know, there's something bigger than me and, and God's not on my side, right? God's on everybody's side. I mean, unless you want to go back to the Crusades, <laughs> you just think, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not correct. And I should be very careful. And in, in Islam, there, you know, there's an understanding of like, you should hide your brother's sin, right? To a certain extent, it depends about the justice and injustice. But there are certain sins that you should just hide and you know, tell them to correct. It doesn't mean all sins. Because if you go around to basically promoting, you know, oh, can you believe that Simon did this, that kind of thing, rather than, you know, you, I don't know, you're abusing children, not something like that. Can you believe that Simon did this? They said, if you do that too, you know, too often, God will start revealing your sin. <laughs> and God knows everything you do. So I, I find that the loss of faith the, and the loss of faith-based community has asked people to create different tribes. And the, because of these tribes, it's either you're with me or you're against me. And that is such a forced dichotomy. So for example, people often say in the US, if you're pro-guns, you must be pro the NRA. Well, you can be pro-guns and anti the NRA, right? You can, be, sure. you can be Muslim and anti Osama bin Laden. <laughs> it's not that I agree with everything another Muslim would say just because I happen to be Muslim. I disagree with a lot of things that Muslims say, like I disagree with a lot of things that British people say. So I think that is a core, a core issue. There's, because when we had the sense of God, I don't necessarily mean the Abrahamic God, but it is in the English language. So it is that God that I'm referring to often. We don't have the sense of maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm on the wrong side. Maybe I'm on the quote unquote wrong side of history. Maybe I'm not correct. Because when I used to use the word, you know, a man or a woman, up until about five years ago, everybody understood what that meant. Now, I have no, I have no qualms of saying trans woman, trans man to be more specific, right? But now we're even saying, well, a trans woman is a woman. And I'm like, well, a trans woman is a trans woman. What do you mean by the word woman? And the people who don't, you know, who are not necessarily understanding the language that other people use, oh, they're wrong. So, well, maybe they just didn't understand your definition because you changed it five minutes ago. So I think the inability to, to forget and forgive and to say, okay, where is this person coming from? Maybe they use the wrong word, but maybe their heart was in the right place. And instead of weaponizing, again, circles of concern. So we've, the chapters is like, you know, put people in circles, not boxes open your arms up and basically hug, you know, hug the person and say, what did you mean by that? What did you mean? Like I accidentally called Jacob Jason, but he could have took offense to that. Go, oh, you don't even remember my name rather than, oh, my tongue just slipped and I've just made a mistake. And I think that's, I think that's the problem is it's, uh, it's faith, you know, loss of faith, but I don't necessarily mean 
loss of religion, but there's the loss of there's something greater than myself. And that great sense of great is not just the community or tribe that I belong to, because that's why my, if I only believe it's my tribe, then I'll do anything to stay anything. I'll do anything to defend it. And I'll do anything to turn a blind eye against what that tribe does to another one. Does that make sense? Simon? I don't know. It was quite a long winded answer. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And and I'm just, I'm so grateful to have you on board with our project because I think, you know, this is just another thing that you bring to the table is just a really, um, a really honest, you know, look at the, 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 the words that we use, the sentences that we use, the, the way that we use our language, you know, and how that is affecting our culture, how that's affecting the general morale of our culture. Um, I, I love it. And I, and I think that this is certainly, this is, this is the kind of conversation I think we need to have a lot more of this in our culture today. And I guess I, I've seen Sharon taking a lot of notes here. So she's probably got more questions for you, but I do. Thanks for listening to the Wild Garden Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd invite you to subscribe so you don't miss out on new episodes posted weekly. If you are interested in gaining access to a wide range of additional content, and participating directly in our discussions, visit us at thewildgarden.com to see what different membership options have to offer. Thanks again, and we hope to have you back.